Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Oh, I love a thumbs up. I love it. Thank you so much. Well, good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here with you today. Um, my name is Dr. Tiffany Butler. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Educational Equity in the Division of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement, or DICE as we affectionately call it. This afternoon, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our esteemed Chancellor for Rutgers University, New Brunswick. With the time allotted, I am hopeful to do her justice. Dr. Fran Conway is the Chancellor of Rutgers University, New Brunswick, a top 20 public university with more than 300 million research portfolio across STEM, the humanities and the arts, and a proud culture of diversity among 40,000 students and 10,000 faculty and staff. She assumed the title of chancellor on July 1st, 2023, after serving as a chancellor provost since July 2021, and previously as the provost. She is also a distinguished professor in the Graduate School of Applied and Professional Psychology, where she has served as dean, where she served as dean from 2016 to 2020, and then is an internationally recognized clinical psych psychologist. As a leader of Rutgers New Brunswick, Chancellor Conway champions the academic master plan, a comprehensive blueprint for the institution's future based on four pillars of excellence, scholarly leadership, innovative research, student success, and community engagement. Its implementation includes bold new initiatives to reimagine the student experience from enrollment to retention and graduation, establish a public health and prevention focused approach to wellness, create interdisciplinary scholarly communities to address society's grand challenges, and expand the access and affordability of higher education. So if you could please join me in the entire DICE division, our Senior Vice President for Equity, Dr. Enomong Anna Branch, in welcoming Chancellor Dr. Fran Conway. Okay, so th thank you, Dr. Butler, for your lovely introduction. And thank you to Senior Vice President Branch, Associate Vice President Collier, and the many team members who have made this event possible. And I'd like to offer special thanks to our community members, our faculty, students, and staff, who made the time to join us, whether here in person or online, for this very important talk. Your presence here shows your commitment to ensuring that this campus community is safe, inclusive, and open to free and respectful exchange of ideas. Our society has seen so much turmoil over the past several years. The pandemic, political divisions, nationwide reckonings on racial injustice and sexual violence, persistence hatred that, it, that really emerges into shocking violence. And the last few months have been particularly challenging as we acknowledge the suffering of our fellow community members and citizens of our nation and of the world. But I remain confident in our ability to come together as a Rutgers New Brunswick community whose members respect each other, respect our differences, and we seek knowledge and understanding and believe in the power of our university's mission to change the world for a better, for, to make this world a better place through excellence in education, research, and service. As I always say, we're stronger together. And that's why University Equity and Inclusion is partnering with my office and those of all the four chancellors across Rutgers to host this series of events that we're calling Meeting the Moment with Humanity. These events include a series of lectures titled Navigating Tensions, Affirming Community. The first of which you'll hear today in just a few minutes from our speaker, Kazu Haga. Now, Meeting the Moment with Humanity series also includes 
Reject Hate documentary series, which will begin on January 31st, the first of which will occur on our campus, Rutgers, New Brunswick, at the cinema. I think it's located on the Livingston campus. And the showing of the documentary is Repairing the World, Stories from the Tree of Life. It's a documentary that focuses on the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in the United States history, which took place in October of 2018 at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. I hope you'll join us for each of these events, and you can learn more from our website, gorutgers.edu, meet the moment. It's very easy, go.rutgers.edu, meet the moment. I also invite you to visit the Chancellor's website, Caring for a Community. It can be found under my uh, website, as I said before, and this site has additional resources and programs. It also talks about what New Brunswick is doing to keep our community safe and to foster dialogue, respectful dialogue. Which brings me to today's highly anticipated speaker, Kazu Haga. He's a nationally regarded practitioner of nonviolence and restorative justice, who teaches conflict reconciliation, organizing, and mindfulness in prisons, jails, high schools, and youth groups, and with activist communities across the country. Now, he encountered the work of social change and nonviolence at the age of 17, I won't say what year, <laughs> when he participated in the interfaith pilgrimage of the Middle Passage, a six-month walking journey from Massachusetts to New Orleans to retrace the slave trade. Powerful. He spent a year studying nonviolence and Buddhism while living in monasteries throughout South Asia and returned to the U.S. at age 19 to begin a lifelong path in social justice work. He wrote a book, Healing Resistance, a radically different response to harm, very much what's needed today. And he is a core member of the Fierce Vulnerability Network and the Ahimsa Collective. Kazu Haga, thank you for coming here, for joining us and helping us uh, create the kind of atmosphere that we want here at Rutgers. Welcome to Rutgers if this is your first time, and we can't wait to hear what you have to share with us today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Conway and Dr. Butler and everyone at the DICE office. Years ago, I used to do a lot of event organizing, so I know how much work goes into <laughs> organizing events. So, you know, everyone behind the scenes as well, Stephanie and Joan and everyone here at the museum, really grateful. Um, I was just sharing with some people that I just got off of a, a red eye from California. And uh, I'm 43 now. I have no shame in that. Um, but, but it was, you know, red eyes were easier 20 years ago, right? Um, this was years ago now. I still remember going out to see some live music. And I, was, I remember thinking, like, can they turn the music down a little bit? It's, it's little. And I realized I was like, okay, this was years ago, and I was starting to get old. Just in the last six months, I have to take off my glasses to look at my phone now. And... and that's the nature of life though, right? As, as we all get old and, and there's nothing that is permanent. Um, but I was thinking that there actually is something that is constant, which is life. Individual life, of course, is not. Everyone is born and everyone dies. But I'm talking about life itself. I have the privilege to live in a community of people, it's about 12 homes and 35 people who we all tore down our back fence and, and we live in deep community in Oakland, California. And uh, let's see, about five weeks ago, a baby was born in, the, in our community, um, little Cloda. And at the end of March, another baby is expected. And then in the middle of, of May, my partner and I are also expecting. 
Um, my best friend just gave birth to his second child uh, about a month ago, a little over a month ago. Um, one of my partner's co-workers is expecting around the same time as we are. One of my former colleagues just gave birth about a month ago. And it just reminds me that even in the midst of war and chaos and catastrophe, that life just continues to say yes to life, right? And it's, it's really affirming to me. Like there's, it's like life can't help itself but to say yes to life and to continue to create beauty along the way. And that it's the very nature of the universe is to continue to create life and to continue to create community. And I almost want to use the words life and the words community interchangeably. And that's a little bit of what I wanted to talk about. I've had the great privilege to spend the last almost two decades now being taught and mentored by elders from the civil rights movement who worked very closely with Dr. King and really deepening in the philosophy of Dr. Martin Luther King, like the stuff that they didn't teach in, in, in public high school. Um, and one of the most important quotes, I think, is this quote about beloved community where he says, the beloved community is the framework for the future. It's the second principle in what is now known as the six principles of Kingian nonviolence. And I think it really sums up the, the essence of the word nonviolence, this word that I thought I knew what it meant until I started really studying Dr. King's work and I realized I had no idea what the word nonviolence meant. When I talk to people about the beloved community, people are always like, oh yeah, my faith community is my beloved community, or my, uh, my political organizing group is my beloved community, my friends, my families. And I always want to challenge people when they say that, because that may be a very loving community, but when Dr. King talked about beloved community, he wasn't talking about loving the people that are easy to love. But he wasn't talking about building community with the people who you're already hanging out with. He was talking about cultivating compassion and understanding for the people that you don't like, yeah, yeah. the people that you see as your opponents. And there's another civil rights icon named Polly Murray who is a little bit of an unsung person. Really, if you haven't heard their name, I um, really recommend you look at their legacy. But they said, when my brothers draw a circle to exclude me, I shall draw a larger circle to include them. And that's what it means to try to create beloved community, right? Is to try to include the people that are trying to kick you out of community into your community. And that's hard work. There's another quote by Dr. King, a famous one. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny that what affects one person directly affects all people indirectly. For Dr. King, this idea of interdependence was a universal law of nature in the same way that gravity is a universal law of nature. A couple years ago, I went on this like deep dive of flat earthers. I don't know if you all know, there's like a, a new movement of people who are convinced that the earth is flat and a lot of them don't believe in gravity, right? Because the earth is flat and that's why we stick to the ground. And it doesn't matter if they don't believe in gravity, right? Because it's a universal law of nature. They're still governed by its laws. And, and I believe, and I believe Dr. King believed that interdependence is the same thing. It doesn't matter if you believe that you're a, a separate autonomous individual being because the universe is structured in a way that is interdependent. You're still governed by its laws. And the universe doesn't weave separate webs of interdependence based on our political affiliation, right? There isn't a, a, a web of interdependence for people on the political left and a separate one for people on the political right. And another quote by an Aboriginal activist, Dr. Leela Watson says, if you have come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound with mine, then let us work together. And this is a quote that's oftentimes very popular in a lot of like progressive circles. But again, I oftentimes wonder how much people really mean that or how much they really believe that my liberation is bound with the liberation of the people that I like 
And my liberation oftentimes actually comes at the expense of those people. Like once we can beat those people, then my people will be liberated. And I don't think that's how the law of interdependence works. And this idea of interdependence is universal. Like it comes across in every wisdom tradition in the world, I believe. Whether you're talking, like in Buddhism, it's, it's very common, right? There's the, the, the teachings of anatta, which is the doctrine of no self, that there is no such thing as an independent self. Or the doctrine of sunyata, of emptiness, that we are all empty of a, an independent self, right? We're all in deep interbeing with every other phenomenon in the universe. But if you look at Christianity, if you look at Judaism, if you look at indigenous cultures, teachings of interdependence are everywhere. If you look at nature and look at the interdependence of ecological systems, and you see how if you take away one species or introduce another species, the ripple effects it has in the entire ecological system. And in science, whether you're talking about quantum entanglement, when two particles becomes entangled and begin to influence each other across space, or whether you're talking about the, rea the scientific reality that nine-tenths of the cells that make up my body are actually non-human organisms, like bacteria and viruses, right? And together, they make up me. Luckily, the Earth is a big place. Beloved community is a big place. I have a friend named Sierra who used to say that beloved community is a big place. And someone could be all the way over there in beloved community. They don't have to come to my house for dinner, but we still hold them in beloved community. Doesn't mean we have to like them. Doesn't mean we have to agree with them. It means we are honoring their dignity and, and sanctity as a human being. And we acknowledge that at some point, if they are not liberated, then I am not liberated, right? doesn't mean they have to come to our birthday parties, but it does mean that we have to acknowledge our shared humanity with each other. And one thing that I've noticed that helps with that is the magic of story. I've had the privilege to work with hundreds of incarcerated people over the years, mostly in prisons across California, and I work mostly with lifers, men serving life sentences, which means that they've caused some real harm. Right? Some of the, the worst things you can imagine us doing to each other as human beings, I've heard hundreds of these stories. And yet every single time, every single time, I've slowed down enough to hear somebody's story, then everything they do begins to make sense. It doesn't condone it, it doesn't make it right, but when I hear the story of someone who took the life of another person and, and really understand where they were at in that moment of their lives, I get to this point of like, oh, of course you killed someone. It doesn't make it right, but I get it. And that's oftentimes what empathy and compassion means. Not about condoning someone's actions or their beliefs or liking that person, but beginning to understand their story enough that we can begin to have compassion for where they might have been. And as someone who, you know, my politics are pretty left, as someone whose politics are pretty far left, it's oftentimes easy to have compassion for historically marginalized communities, right? What's oftentimes harder is, say, someone that looks like this person. Uh, this is Officer Geronimo Yanez. He's the officer who shot and killed Philando Castile. You know, I hang out with a lot of police abolitionists and the like, and it's oftentimes considered almost um, like traitorous to try to understand the story of a police officer. And I get it, it's hard, I, I totally get it. And we're taught in nonviolence that if you don't understand the other side of a conflict, then you're responding to the conflict with at best half of the information that you need. Even if the other side of the conflict is completely wrong, the way they're perceiving the conflict is at least half of the story. 
So again, the need to understand the story of Officer Yanez, who, as it turns out, the year prior to the shooting of Philando Castile, had attended two workshops run by a public company called Calibre Press run out of Boston. And they, the Calibre Press runs seminars for police officers all over the country. And one of them is called the Bulletproof Warrior Training. And Officer Yanez attended two of these weekend seminars in the year leading up to the shooting. And I've seen the curriculum for the Bulletproof Warrior Training. And it essentially shows image after image after image of police officers who were killed in the line of duty. And the main message is that if you feel like you are afraid, if you hesitate even for a second to pull the trigger, you might end up on this slide next. And here's all the legal ways that you can get away with shooting someone if you feel like your life is in danger. And so these officers are literally being trained to be afraid and trained to be trigger happy. And then we armed, I also just recently found this out too. It takes, in California, it takes over two times as many hours to become a barber as it does to become a cop. And so I think we really underestimate how poorly trained police officers are and, and, and how they're being trained. And then you arm them and you put them in these potentially life-threatening situations and it's no wonder why there's so much violence, right? It begins to make sense once you unpack the story. And even Donald Trump, who, you know, I, 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 it still hasn't sunk in that it's an election year for me. Like, I'm a little afraid to, to admit what that means. Um, but as someone who's worked with a lot of tra trauma survivors, when I look at Donald Trump, it becomes very obvious to me that he's a deeply traumatized man. And he has this, like, massive gaping hole in his heart that he's constantly trying to fill with external validation. And I remember years ago, um, right after his first presidency, his, his first election, I heard uh, Noam Chomsky being interviewed on Democracy Now! And he was saying that Trump is not a fascist because fascism is a legitimate ideology and Trump has no ideology. He's just operating from a place of fear and that that's what makes him even more dangerous because if he's following an ideology, then there's some sense of where he's going. But someone who's operating purely out of fear, you have no idea what they're gonna do next. And I see how much support Donald Trump still has in this country with what happened in New Hampshire, what happened in Iowa. And people talk about how much they feel inspired by Donald Trump, right? And I actually wonder if it's people actually being inspired by Donald Trump or if there's some weird sense of trauma bonding to see someone in such a public space, so obviously operating from their trauma. And I really believe that the trauma of Donald Trump so well encapsulates the trauma of America. And a lot of people who share that trauma can look at that and identify with it and saying, there's something happening there that I can also feel. And trauma bonding is when two people begin to, to develop some relationship because of a shared traumatic experience, right? And so particularly like white men in this country can see the trauma of white men being acted out on a national stage and they begin to bond with that, right? And so then it begins to become a little bit easier for me to have compassion. Not to say that I agree with anything coming out of Donald Trump's mouth, but it begins to become easier to understand why these things are happening. We live in a world filled with triggers, whether it's a dog that's barking after us or we get a call from the boss that we don't like or we look at our schedule for the next week and it's so jam-packed with meetings that at times our body feels like it's in danger. And what happens when we feel threatened is we go into panic. And what happens when we go into panic, as some people may know, is in our brains, we go into what psychologists call the amygdala hijacking, where the amygdala, which is an older part of our brain, it's the emotional center of our brain, 
hijacks our prefrontal cortex, which is right uh, on the other side of our forehead. The prefrontal cortex is the most evolved part of our brain. And it's the part of our brain that's known as like the executive functioning center of our brain. When we lose access to our prefrontal cortex, we lose our ability to think about logic and rationale. We lose our ability to take in new information or take in different perspectives. Everything becomes black and white. We become hyper reactive and hyper vigilant. And part of why this is happening is because the prefrontal cortex is a part of our brain that requires a lot of energy to run. So when we feel like our life is in danger, our brain automatically channels as much energy as it can into the parts of our brain that is responsible for our immediate survival. Like if a saber-toothed tiger is running after you, you don't need to think about logic. There's nothing, there's like there's no rationale that you need. To, you, need you don't need to think about, oh, if this tiger gets me, it's gonna hurt, it might kill me, so I better run. You just run, right? There's, binary thinking is fine. That's a very black and white situation. And at the same time, all this is happening in our brain, something is also happening in our body, which is the activation of something called the sympathetic nervous system. And what that does is it pumps adrenaline and cortisol throughout our entire body. It increases our heart rate, our muscles tighten up, our digestive system shut down, and again, all of these things prepare our bodies for the fight or flight response. The reason I'm saying this is because when our amygdala hijacks our prefrontal cortex, when our sympathetic nervous system kicks in, our ability to practice nonviolence goes out the window. Our ability to practice community goes out the window. Our ability to think about nuance our ability to take in different information, our ability to have compassion and empathy, that all goes out the window because that's not necessary for immediate survival. When conflict happens, we oftentimes go into this survival mechanism, right? Because conflict can be really scary. This happens in our families, it happens in our communities, it happens throughout nations. But conflict, one of the things that I learned through nonviolence is that conflict is not a bad thing. That things like yelling and fighting, those things are not conflicts. Things like yelling and fighting and arguing, those are what happens when you mismanage a conflict. Right? It's the outcome of a mismanaged conflict. You have a conflict in your life, and you can respond to it in a way that ends up with a lesson learned or a strengthened relationship, or you can respond to a conflict and you can end up in an argument. Right, so the conflation of the idea of conflict and yelling, arguing, sometimes even violence, is really harmful. And because we understand conflict as violence, when we get into a conflict, we go into panic. Right? And then everything is binary, it's us versus them. And one of the things that I, I recently read by uh, a woman named Sarah Shulman, Adrienne Marie Brown also talked about this in one of their books, is that in our society today, we have a tendency to conflate conflict with harm, which again is an outcome of conflict, and even abuse, which is when harm is happening with, with power dynamics, right? When conflict happens, we assume that that's abuse. When someone says something that we disagree with, we feel like they are threatening us and our survival is, is at stake. And there's another um, social scientist whose work I really like who says that microaggressions are a real thing and they cause real harm and we need to be able to name it and we need to train people to stop doing it and calling it a microaggression orients us to that incident in a way that might be more escalated than we need it to be because oftentimes microaggressions are not actually acts of aggression. There's just misunderstandings, right? Maybe rooted in some ignorance, but no one's actually aggressing you. But if we experience that as an act of aggression and we orient ourselves to that conflict as someone is aggressing me, then our response to that conflict is going to be way more escalated than we need it to be. 
So we need to learn to have discernment and to right-size our response to conflict, right? And figure out the appropriate response to the conflicts that are inevitable every day in our lives. If someone is pro-choice, it doesn't mean that they want to kill babies. But that's oftentimes the perception from the pro-life side. If someone supports the Second Amendment, it doesn't mean they don't care about the safety of our children in schools. But that's oftentimes the perspective of people who advocate for gun control, right? These are really, like people on the other side are not as radical as we think they might be. But there's another reason why it's so hard for us to right-size conflict and to discern what's really happening in our society today. Because in addition to all these like personal triggers, we're experiencing a climate crisis, we're experiencing war, we're experiencing pandemics. These are things that we're experiencing not as individuals but as a species. And so what that leads to is a collective panic zone. Like as a species, we are constantly getting triggered and going into our fight or flight response. And so as a species, we are experiencing like collective trauma responses, right? If I experience a traumatic response, I go into black and white thinking. Our society today is extremely polarized and in black and white thinking because collectively we are experiencing something that we know through science to be true as individuals, right? In times of instability, we, we crave stability. And there's something so stabilizing about an us versus them worldview. Because it's simple. It's not complicated. And that simplicity feels safe and it feels grounding. In times of uncertainty, we want certainty. And if there's an us and there's a them, well, at least there's an us that I belong to, right? And that feels safe. But that us versus them worldview, I, I believe, is ultimately delusional. I know more than I care to know what it feels like to not belong. And, and I'm pretty sure that everyone in the world knows deeply what it feels like to not belong. We've all experienced this. And psychologists will also say that this fear of not belonging and being alone and isolated is one of the most common sources of trauma as human beings because we are communal creatures. We are interdependent creatures. Every single person experiences this. And at the same time, if we do live in an interdependent world, then there's nothing outside of belonging, right? There's nothing outside of interdependence. Not belonging is actually not an option. It, it, it's not something that can happen. It's not something that can exist within the boundaries of an interdependent reality. And yet, so many of us, perhaps all of us, have some fear of not belonging, which is why a lot of the work when I started when 17, 18 years old, was around protesting and fighting for justice. And over the last 10 years, I've really started to focus more and more on healing work. Because I've noticed that the more I heal, the more I can ground myself in universal belonging. And the more I know that I belong, the less I feel a need to threaten another person's sense of belonging. But it's also not enough. Healing work, it's not enough. And it's not enough for two reasons. One is individual liberation is a delusion. Like the billion dollar wellness industry will tell us that if we pay thousands of dollars to go to a yoga retreat and, and, and get all of our groceries at Whole Foods, we will become more free. But in an interdependent world, there's no such thing as individual liberation. There's only collective liberation. And also, there are systems and institutions and cultural norms that are in place that keep us from belonging, that are constantly, actively creating harm and separation at a pace that is much faster than we can heal at the individual level. 
There's a leader in the Black Lives Matter movement who once said that we're, we're told to heal collective wounds as individuals. Like so much of our wounding is relational and collective and generational, and yet we're taught to go to an individual therapist and work it out. And that's, I have an individual therapist. I love individual, there's a role for that, but it can only get us so far, right? And so there's always gonna be a need for powerful movements to, to fight these larger systems. And in my time in movement work, you know, in nonviolence, we're taught that the more a conflict is escalated, the more we have to escalate our nonviolent response to that conflict. So at an interpersonal level, if someone's having like a, a difficult day, you can go to that person and say, hey, everything's fine, just take a deep breath, right? And if we kind of zoom out of that fractal, at a social level, we might fill out a petition. That's the appropriate response to a low level escalation of conflict. But as the conflict escalates, our response to that has to escalate too. So we might have to get in between two people who are fighting and pull them apart of, from each other. We might have to occupy bridges and government buildings. Right? That's why the movement for black lives never fills out petitions because the conflict that that movement is responding to is way too escalated for that. But one thing I've noticed in my time doing nonviolent action work is that the more we escalate our responses to conflict, the more we escalate our tactics that we use to respond to violence, the more we tend to escalize, escalate polarization. Right? The more we escalate this us versus them worldview, which again makes sense because the conflict is so escalated, the conflict feels so black and white. If you're in a demonstration and there's screaming and yelling and you might get tear gassed, it's very easy for us to go into the panic zone. But again, I believe that that us versus them worldview is at the heart of what is destroying this planet. And so here we are using escalated forms of nonviolence to try to create a world of belonging, but the ways that we go about doing it are actually rooted in the, 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 the problem that created this mess to begin with, right? One of the incarcerated nonviolence trainers that I work with in Soledad Prison in California once told me that resolving a conflict is about fixing issues while reconciling a conflict is about repairing relationships. And nonviolence is about trying to do both. That oftentimes in our movement work, we go about trying to fix issues, like what's the legislation that we need to pass? What's the policy we need to change? And that's obviously a part of it, right? You have to fix issues in order to be able to address the relationship. But too often, we only focus on fixing the issue and we don't place any emphasis on the relationships that were harmed because of the conflict to begin with. And so if we don't reconcile the conflict, that, that animosity and that division is still there and it's just gonna surface in some other issue that we're gonna need to fix later, right? So how do we build social movements that have the power? How do we mobilize the power to fix issues but also cultivate the love to repair relationships? Again, a lot of that work has to start at the individual level. Um, I'll share one more story. Years ago, uh, I had the honor to facilitate a dialogue between um, a woman named Cynthia and a man named Richard, and I have their permission to share their story. Um, Cynthia is an indigenous grandmother who lives in California, and 20 years ago, her son Mitchell was murdered. Um, and Richard is one of the men who took her son's life away. And 20 years after this crime, Cynthia reached out to us at the Ahimsa Collective um, and said, I wanna have a dialogue with Richard. I've never had the opportunity to come face to face with him. It's a whole other thing about the criminal justice system and they never actually give people an opportunity to be in dialogue with each other at all. Um, I can go on a whole other rant about that, but. Um, and you know, it took six months to bring the dialogue together to talk to both sides individually. And, and I remember the day the dialogue happened, we went in and went into the prison that Richard is in and we sat Cynthia down and I went around the corner to the holding tank where Richard was and he was already shaking and already crying. And I sat down next to him and, and talked to him for a little while and when he was ready, you know, we stood up and he turned the corner and he saw Cynthia down the hall 
and he just completely broke down. And Cynthia stood up and opened her arms, and they just embraced in this hug that felt like it lasted hours. And then they talked for six hours, nonstop. And I could tell you so many magical moments from that day, but, but one moment where Cynthia was holding Richard's hands, and she was saying, I had a dream that I needed to hold your hands because these are the hands that took my son's life away, and I needed to have a different relationship with these hands. And is this, this like thing where it's almost as if Cynthia was there holding Richard's pain and helping him heal through his lifetime of violence. And I realized that in this interdependent world where there is no up, down, left, right, there is no binary, that restorative justice work at its best begins to blur the line between victim and perpetrator and can just acknowledge that harm is here and we all need healing. Obviously what happened with Cynthia and Richard is like bench pressing 300 pounds. <laughs> Right? It took them both 20 years of their own healing journeys to, to get them to that place, right? And so what are the 10-pound weights that we can start with? <laughs> Part of it is just learning to breathe. When we realize that we're in our panic, to, to, to be able to name, like, oh, I'm in my panic. Let me take a deep breath. But also as someone who's had a meditation practice for 15 years, I didn't realize when I started meditating that I didn't know how to breathe. 15 years later, I can get a lot more out of one breath than I could 15 years ago. Because something as easy as breathing actually takes practice. Trying to take in different perspectives that you might not agree with. These days there's so many like media companies that are doing this kind of thing. Um, rather than getting our news from the, the, the tunnel vision, that, the echo chamber that is social media, All Sides, which is a news site that takes the headlines and gives like a really short summary of what's going on and then links the perspectives from the left, right, and center so you can get all perspectives. Um, places like Open to Debate, Braver Angels, which does amazing work bringing people together across divides. These are places where we can begin to practice taking in different perspectives so that when we actually experience it in real life, we're not as triggered. And then potentially even moving on to something I love to do, which is to take in like extreme perspectives that I disagree with, right? To begin to see if I can try to understand where that perspective is coming from. And to stay curious, I was listening to a podcast um, by Braver Angels recently, and they said that when you're in a political argument with somebody, there's two questions that are really key. One is, how did you come to believe that? Not why do you believe that, but how did you come to believe that? And also, why does that, why does that statement make you feel safe and make me feel unsafe? Right? Questions that invoke curiosity, to try to really understand where someone is coming from versus to try to prove the other person wrong, right? And again, we need it to be grounded enough, and we need to have that prefrontal cortex connected in order for us to hear these different perspectives. And also, of course, to commit to our own healing, knowing that we're not doing our own healing work so that we can be liberated, but we're working on our own healing so we can be part of a more regulated collective nervous system so that we can build movements for beloved community and for belonging. Um, and the last thing that I want to share, and I'd love to open it up for some conversation too, is how do I say this? Um, years ago, my, my friend Carlos Saavedra once said that even in our most successful movements, our demands are always to get the state to do something for us. And we don't dream big enough. And I don't know, this is where I might lose some of you all because my politics are like pretty far out. But in this election year, it's not that I don't care about Trump or Biden. Like obviously the impact matters, but it doesn't excite me. I'm actually pretty sad that it looks like these are gonna be the two choices that we're given. But even as someone whose politics are pretty far left, like I, I wouldn't be that excited about Bernie Sanders for president. What I'm excited about is abolishing the office of the presidency. 
Because in this day and age, it makes no sense to me why we centralize so much power to one person. There is no reason that I can come up with why it makes sense for one person to have so much power. That's the, the level that I want to dream at. We're taught that right now, we either have to advocate for freedom for Palestine or safety for Israel. A, I think that's a false binary. And secondly, I happen to believe that the idea of nation states is a violent ideology because it perpetuates the delusion of separation. So what does it mean for someone like me to believe in liberation for all people in that region outside of the context of the nation state? I have a friend who works on immigration issues who's always talking about what does it mean to fight for justice and belonging for all immigrant, refugee, migrant communities outside of the context of citizenship to a nation state? As if citizenship is like the end all be all, right? What does it mean to really belong to each other and to build real beloved community? So we have, like if our intention is not just to build loving communities with people who are going to show up at the same events, but to build beloved community with people who are on the opposite side of town, then we need the audacity to dream big. Because so much of our dreaming and our visioning oftentimes happens within the contours of cultural norms and systems that are keep there to keep us separated. And so we have to be able to think outside of the box. In this interdependent world, there is no life without community, right? And there is no community without life. They're the same things. Life and community are the same things. And in a time when we feel like community is so hard to build, I think it's so important to remember that in a universe that is structured to always create life, that means that it's structured in a way to also always create community. And so I'm grateful to each of you for taking a little bit of time today to say yes to life, to say yes to community and for being here. So I want to pause here and, and open up for discussion, but thank you all so much for being here. Okay, is it on? All right. Uh, you know, I have comments later, but for right now, questions. Or, or answers. I went or to the Dharma talk oh. where the, where the, the teacher opened up the Q and A with. Uh, all right, who's got some answers? So coming back. Questions, answers, reactions, anything. Thank you so much for this. There's there's so much goodness to unpack after we leave and continue our conversations. I would love to get some of your wisdom around one of. So in our work around conflict. I often hear folks, and I would, myself included, right, who speak to the idea about the other person not meeting them halfway, right? Mm -hmm. And so what do you do when you've bought into this ethos, our, in, our interdependence, but you are engaging with someone who doesn't give a damn, right? If I, and so, um, and, and that is a, that's been a consistent barrier, is that yeah. folks just feel like, well, why am I doing this if they're not willing to meet me in the middle? So I would love oh. to hear any thoughts you have around yeah, how we work through that. Thank you, lots of thoughts. Um, one is, I, I think this is like the million dollar question in restorative justice, right? Because like in restorative conflict engagement, you can't force someone to the table. Uh, it, it, it's, it's antithetical to the, the work that we do. Um, so a lot of the work that I'm doing with this group called the Fierce Vulnerability Network and this, this idea of fierce vulnerability, which has been growing in our minds for the last several years, is, is kind of about that. It's about reimagining nonviolent direct action as a modality of collective trauma healing and, and almost like forcing issues to the table because active harm is being done, right? And when active harm is being done, it like ups the bar a little bit of um, how do we, uh, not violently, but like really force conversations to the table that some people might not be ready for. And fierce vulnerability is really just a bunch of questions and experiments and no answers, but we know, I know through experience, that when I go into a room of traumatized people and I'm able to model vulnerability, the possibilities that opens up that wasn't there 30 seconds prior to that 
is, is really transformative. And when we engage in direct action, we tend to engage with this like, we're here to shut things down worldview. And what if we still use similar tactics, but move with an energy of we're actually here to open things up? And what is the work that we need to do as movements to show up on the front lines with that spirit and leading not with like, F you, you're wrong, but leading with we are hurting because of all of these issues and this is the impact that it's having. Could that open up different possibilities? And so I think because we live in a world of fractals, like if you just zoom in on that and imagine what that looks like at the interpersonal level, not to say that it's always gonna be possible, but I know that there's been times when I've been in conflict with family members and they've refused to engage in it until I've been able to ground myself enough in my truth and led with, hey, my heart is breaking because this is where our relationship is right now. And this is the impact that it's having on me I think it's tricky because vulnerability leaves you open, right? And there's a, um, a person named Reverend, Reverend Nadia Bowles-Weber who says, preach from your scars, not from your wounds. And so what is the healing that I need to do around this relational harm so that I can still stay connected to my vulnerability but have enough of a protective shield, a scar around it, so that if it's not met well by the other person, I'm not re-traumatized by it. Right, And so again, like, what's the work that I need to do to prepare to show up in that relationship in a way that might open up a little bit more willingness on their part and keep me protected, right? And so that's some of my thoughts, yeah. Uh, You've offered us such brilliance. I want to ask you to speak to the how of what you just described, Yeah. right? Because what you talked about, many of us are nodding, but how do you do that? Where would you say someone should start with that? Because it's the frame you gave us. Uh, we're seeking individual healing for collective trauma, yeah. right? And so that frame of the how, yep. how do you do healing work that allows you to be vulnerable but not re-traumatized. I think that's what so many are struggling with. Yeah, there's th there's no cookie cutter way, right? So I'll just share kind of my own journey. Um, I remember years ago, I went to this group retreat called Jams. Um, Jams are these like week-long transformative retreats run by this organization called Yes, um, <laughs> which I, I'm honored to be part of now. Um, and I talked about a childhood traumatic experience for the first time out loud. And at that moment, I was like, this is something that happened 20 years ago. People are sharing vulnerable things. So I'm going to open up, but it's not that big of a deal. I've healed. I'm over it. And then I went into complete panic and just completely broke down. And I realized, how, I realized at that moment, A, I need to have a conversation with my family. And B, the idea of having a conversation with my family was the scariest thing I could think of to do. And it took me eight years to get to that conversation with my family. And it was individual talk therapy, it was meditation retreats, it was journaling, it was having conversations with my friends. It was like whatever works for you, but I will say again that like harm happens in relationship and I really believe that healing also has to happen in relationship. And so like community mental health work is so valuable. For me to be able to say, I experienced this, I'm hurting because of this, I'm ashamed of this, in a community, and to know that if I say this thing that I'm ashamed about loud, on the other side of that is even deeper belonging, yeah. is incredibly liberating. Yeah. And so find it, like I love talk therapy, I love my therapist, and we need more and more community grieving spaces, community raised spaces, community healing spaces. I think that's, that it's such important work. Check out yesworld.org. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for this. My name is Will Vargas, and I am a community-based counselor. So this very much resonates right. with what we're talking about and very much related, actually, to both of the questions that, um, you know, have been asked is, as you have been doing this work um, throughout your life, what are perhaps one or two things that you have observed um, that we can consider moving on forward um, that 
you have noticed that nurtures and continues to grow connections mm -hmm. between people while remaining centered and rooted in your own self, mm -hmm. which is related to, right, not getting re-traumatized, but what are one of those, you know, things that you have found that helps for other people as well as keeping oneself grounded? Thank you. Um, I, I, I keep wanting to go back to jams. I actually just, th these last two days I was hosting um, the Asian Diaspora Jam team because we're organizing the Asian Diaspora Jam in March. And so it was just six of us meeting in our home. And so much of the work that happens at jams is just like, actually, let me say this. In the organization that I used to work with, every week we would, have, we would start our, our staff meetings with a check-in circle. And years ago when our organization was just two people, our check-in circles would oftentimes last 45 minutes every week, right? And in our culture where we're taught to ask people how they're doing and then to respond by saying, I'm doing fine, how are you? To take the time to say, actually, I'm not doing okay and I need support is so supportive and transformative and it's such an easy thing. Like there's a way in which things like healing is really complicated and takes a lot of training and expertise and all that. And there's another way in which healing is so simple. It's as simple as looking people in the eye and saying, how are you really doing? And not trying to fix them, not trying to interpret what's going on for them, but just being there for them. And I think the more we can create spaces like that, and the more we can get out of the urgency of like the pace that we're taught that we have to work at, whether it's in higher ed or corporations or whatever, we're like it's just this extreme pace. And in the midst of everything going on in the world, I think that even a 40 hour work week is just not sustainable, right? And so there's another one of my favorite quotes that uh, strangely enough comes from the US Marines. They say, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And so in this moment of urgency, how can we slow down enough to really honor our relationships? Because the more we can slow down, the smoother we are, and the smoother we are, the more efficiently we can respond to all the urgent crises of our times. And so I think the, the best thing we can do is just see how each other are doing in every, every moment. You know? Oh, okay. All right, I'm gonna take these two questions. We're gonna synthesize them, we're gonna go to you, then cool. I'm gonna wrap us up because we got snacks upstairs. All right, sounds good. All right. <laughs> Time is infinite, but baby, we are constrained by it. All right, Thank you. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, and you. here on campus, I direct our Eagleton Institute of Politics. Mm. So we talk politics, we teach talking politics, yeah. and certainly our goal is to give students skills to have difficult conversations. I was struck, in particular, your conversation about breathing mm. and widening that gap between stimulus and response. Yeah. And I'm interested, uh, do you have any best practices? You know, we teach active mm -hmm. listening, perspective taking, fact checking, but I don't know if there are some good best practices on that, teaching students how to pause. Yeah, thank you. Sure. You want me? I just want to first uh, thank everybody in this room who was involved in making this happen because I feel like I'm in the first sane space. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, that I have been in, in a long time. And I, I, I woke up the other day and I told my partner, we're in a post-sane world. And I have, because of um, physical challenges, uh, chronic pain, I have been in the world of meditation, healing, um, embodiment, breathing for 30 years, but crossing that into my academic world, and I'm the director of the Institute for Women's Leadership, and I know a lot of the people in this room and have such respect for them, but we never get the time to just sit down and look in each other's eyes and ask, how are you doing? Did you have a chance to breathe today? Or just taking time to hear each other's stories. And the moment you hear each other, I taught a course in storytelling for 10 years at the beginning of my career. And all we did in those classes was tell each other stories. And they were the most profoundly transformative story, uh, classes I've taught. So. 
I am so glad you're here today. I want to thank you for everything. I want to go to jams, or, you know, <laughs> wherever it is, because that may be a sane world. And, yeah. and my question is, how do we get universities and educational spaces to slow down and actually realize that between the brain and the heart and the, and the body, there's actually a bridge? Yeah. And I would just love to see that happen. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, try to be quick. I, I just found out that that's actually not a Viktor Frankl quote. It was a whole thing. That I, yeah, I just found that out. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, I have a friend who's a direct action trainer who says that there's always time to take a breath. And even when a riot police officer is running towards you with a baton, there's still time to take a breath. But I think oftentimes we don't recognize that we need to take a breath. And so uh, I guess there's two things that I want to say to respond to the first question, which is you know, when we teach meditation to new folks, one of the things that we do is, you know, if I close my eyes right now, I immediately can feel the, the hardness of the wood on my left hand. My throat is a little parched. I'm, the, the light is bright on my eyes, so it's like fluttering a little bit. And those are three things that I didn't notice 15 seconds ago, right? And so to bring mindfulness practices so that we can begin to get better at noticing what's going on so that when someone says a, a, a perspective that they disagree with, they can notice, oh, my brain just, like something clicked in my brain and I'm no longer taking in information, so I need to take a breath, yeah. right? Um, and the second thing is, like I love Open to Debate, which is one of the, the podcasts that I always listen to. Um, but it's still a debate show where it's like truth is a zero-sum game and you figure out who had the better argument. And I would love to see more of like, let me make sure that I understood what you're saying, right? Like how can I get better, not at like proving you wrong, but actually um, reflecting back what you said. So I think the practice of like reflecting back, when I'm in a conflict, I really try hard to begin by reflecting back what my partner just said to make sure that like they feel heard, that I got everything they're saying before I say my piece. And so I think that's a really, really valuable skill. Um, and I'm sorry, your question was around how to get universities. Yeah, um, I mean, it's such hard work. Um, it seems like there's some folks who are in higher positions here that are, that are part of this event. Um, and it's really hard to, to transform organizations without support from the top. My mentor, Dr. Lafayette, who trained me in nonviolence, always talks about how nonviolence is not the opposite of violence, it's the antidote to violence. And the ways that violence has been institutionalized, we need to institutionalize its antidote. And so looking at the ways that violence and binary thinking and black and white thinking has been institutionalized in our institutions and across our cultures and beginning to institutionalize its antidote. And I'll just share, because there's so much more I can say to that, but I'll just share my favorite resource on transforming systems is a book called Rethinking Organizations. It's a terrible name. It's a much more exciting book than the title. <laughs> But it, it really like changed my, my, my worldview on how I think about organizational structures and how to, how to transform systems. Um, so that's a great resource if you want to check it out. Rethinking Organizations, yeah, by Frederick LaRoe. Le, Le, Le so. Cool. Y'all go ahead and give it up for our keynote today. Oh my goodness, I got notes on notes on notes. Uh, I'm gonna take us about two minutes over. I'm really sorry, Jessica. I read uh, the harm book, Healing Resistance, and that thing blessed me down. It took me a couple of months to get through it because so much of what you talked about today is not just what we do, but how we understand and imagine and that thought work, that mind shift work takes a minute. Every time I would read it, was like reading all about Love by Bell Hooks. I'd have to stop and go, oof. And I'm churchy, so in church, if, you, if, if something said that hit you, you just say, oh, just say excuse me because I just stepped on your toes. There was a lot of ouching going on, but it was just so wonderful. And so you can go ahead and have a seat because you've been up all day, <laughs> all day. A couple things I'm taking back with me are the ideas of community as life. If community and life are interchangeable, when we, when we say we're building community, we're building life. 
And I don't fathom a life without community. So I appreciate that one. Uh, there's just so many more pieces. I'm going to go back to my proper remarks so we can go. <laughs> I'm refreshed. One good breath if we can just in and a good out. My goodness. I would be remiss not to plug our Clara workshop. Clara is a de-escalation um, technique around conversation, uh, centering, listening, affirming, then responding, and then adding knowledge. It runs through the Tyler Clemente Center here in New Brunswick, but through the Diversity Education Network, you can have it um, provided for your department or you can come to an open registration session. I'm back on script because my team knows I can chat. Thank you so much, Kazu. Thank you, truly, I mean, sincerely. Um, I think of moments such as these as organizational pause moments of rest where we get to stop and folks get to gather in real time or on a live stream, shout out to the live stream people, um, to make a conscious choice to still ourselves and explore what someone else has to offer us that could aid in our reflection and our forward action. I hope that folks taken, uh, are taking with them tools, perspectives, and commitments needed to be in community and not just in proximity with folks in the midst of rapid polarization, discomfort, and profound grief. I'm also a death doula and a birth doula, and I feel grief all the time around me. Uh, today's talk is part of a larger series, Navigating Tension, um, Affirming Communities. Uh, we are going to have our next one on February 28th, but next week you can catch us uh, with uh, repairing, oh gosh, repairing the world at the Rucker Cinema on the 31st. Registration is still open. It will also be live streamed. Um, it's part of a broader Rejecting Hate piece. You can follow us at Rutgers, um, our Rutgers IG for diversity is RU Diversity. Um, our thanks to the Zimberly Museum art staff, to the media productions team for making this live stream and recording a reality, to the University Equity and Inclusion and Division for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement staff, particularly who are going to fight me after this is over, Stephanie Smith, Lajanice Harris, and Jessica Zura for their coordination and execution of today's event. I want to say we are as strong as our partnerships and collaborations. We are connected in this. A final thank you to every person who joined the talk here in live, uh, live stream, and folks who are going to join us later. Come back to this. Come back to this. This is not a one and done. Come back to it. Let it play in the background. Have your class resonate with it. Think about what the practices look like for real, for real. Let yourself meditate and reflect on it, right? Uh, folks who, who are doing all that, for making time to invest in collective knowledge building, life building, and purposeful deliberation about who we want to be as a community. If we are intertwined together, how do we do this? That's all for me. Oh, I'm Joan Collier, Assistant Vice President for Equity and Inclusion. <laughs> and University of Equity and Inclusion, my bad. Folks online, we'll see y'all later. Everybody here, it's next upstairs. Let's go fellowship. Thanks, y'all.